I want to know how Julio fits into this. You know, Julio Iglesias. So his name is Julio <laughs> no, no, no. Church. No, no, no. What's his it's, name? It's, it's, Ju- it's July, July Church. Churches. July Churches. July plural. Church. Yeah, yeah. July Church. July. Yeah. Okay. And so you're looking for so another in- singer to impersonate. So I'll do the Willie Nelson part of <laughs> "To All the Girls That I've Loved Before," and you do the Julio Iglesias part, and we'll we'll make it match up. <laughs> Well, no, I, I, I will say that song is not appropriate to sing in church. So we, <laughs> I would not think so. <laughs> yeah, but if, if but, but if yeah. Julio decided to study ecclesiology, how would you say that then in Spanish? Julio ecclesiologist, ecclesi- ecclesiologist. Not even going to try. Somebody's going to fix yeah. this in the comments. Somebody's going to help us all. <laughs> yeah. Hello and welcome to another slow roasted and fork tender episode of On the Journey with Matt and Ken and Kenny. We've missed you all and it's great to be back. Uh, If you're joining us for the first time or have only joined us recently and have forgotten everything about us, we are with the Coming Home (laughs) Network, a group of people who have come from various backgrounds and somehow or other ended up in the Catholic Church. Ken Hensley was a Baptist pastor, Kenny Burchard was a Foursquare church pastor. Uh, I worked at Family Christian Store and played Christian music festivals. And we all, like I say, are trying to share a little bit of our journey. Uh, We're starting a brand new series today on the church. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But want to let you know, visit us at chnetwork.org to find all kinds of great resources, um, most of them free. You can also join our online community if you have questions and are looking for fellowship and support. That's community.chnetwork.org. And... You can also give to support this effort so that we can continue to make things free. Uh, that's at chnetwork.org slash compass. Gentlemen, do we need to do some like warm-ups, a few laps around the building, or are you guys ready to just dive right into it? I'm ready. I, I, I was uh, wondering how you were going to start this episode, Matt, for a slow-roasted and fork tender. <laughs> that's so good. Uh, well, yeah, this episode that, I'm, series I'm has been in the <laughs> it's been in the crock pot for a little while. So I, just, I mean, we've been in the lab in the kitchen. One thing, Matt. One together. thing, Matt is you forgot to include those who maybe watched an episode of On the Journey yesterday and have forgotten about us. Yes, <laughs> that's uh, the, the goldfish among us. <laughs> so, all right, yeah, it's good to be back. It's been a while. Feels feel it feels a little strange actually, a little like nervous, like the first time on TV type thing. But but go for it, whatever you're going to do, well, go. Just like uh, any baseball player starting a new season, you know, you just get the mechanics right. down. Well, we are going to get some vocabulary down to start things off. We're doing this whole series on the church. Like, what is the church? Um, what do we mean when we use that word? Uh, what would we have? thought about even the concept of there being a church. We're going to get into a whole bunch of things related to that uh, over the course of several episodes here. But Kenny, since you're the vocab man, uh, what's our vocabulary word, vocabulary word uh, to start things off today? <laughs> the word for the day, the Catholic word. Uh, yeah, we're going to start with the, the word church in the Greek language, uh, which is ecclesia. Mm-hmm. If you took Spanish class like I did in high school, you learned that church was iglesia. And so there's that, the, the sound of the word almost exactly the same between Spanish and Greek, ecclesia. Uh, so the study of the church then is ecclesiology and people who uh, focus on the church in their writings and their studies, for instance, will uh, be said to take an ecclesial emphasis uh, in their writings. And that's because the word behind church in English is the Greek word ecclesia. And it's not always used, in fact, originally wasn't used in a religious context or having necessarily religious connotations. In classical Greek, you can find it being used to refer to an assembly of people or a gathered group of people who are called together for some kind of of gathering. Most often it would be, for instance, a community gathering where 
the elders of a community would be called together by some sort of signal, maybe a bell or something, to conduct the business of the community. And so this gathered group of people who have all uh, this common purpose together are gathered into a congregation is an ecclesia. Well, that word comes to be used in the Old Testament to refer to the assembly of God's people. When God's people are gathered together in the Septuagint, the Greek uh, translation of the Old Testament, you'll often find this word used, ecclesia, to refer to the gathered assembly of God's people. And then, of course, in the New Testament, when Jesus talks about what he's up to, what he's doing, he says, I will build my church. He says it to Peter in Matthew, uh, Matthew's gospel. I will build my church. He uses that word, ecclesia, and he says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, so Jesus is building this assembly of his, this gathered community of his mm -hmm. around himself and his lordship. And that gathered community or people are the ecclesia. And we find it used all throughout the New Testament in the book of Acts, um, in the letters, of course, and in the book of Revelation. It's used to refer to local assemblies of Christians. It's used to refer to the entire universal uh, people of God gathered around Jesus. It's used to refer to regional groupings of churches. For instance, the church of Ephesus or the church of Thyatira or the church of Laodicea in the seven letters to the churches in Revelation. So it all is referring to the church of Jesus Christ. And that's kind of what we're looking at. Like, what, what in the world is that? What is the ecclesia? of Jesus and what did Jesus mean by mm. the word mm. ecclesia. So that's enough vocabulary for now, unless you guys have anything you want to well, add to it. it can, well, except I want to know how Julio fits into this, you know, Julio Iglesias. So his name is Julio <laughs> no, no, no. Church? No, no, no. What's his it's, name? It's, it's, Ju it's July, July Church. Churches. July Churches. July plural. Churchia. Yeah, July Churches. July. Yeah. Okay, and so you're looking for so another in, singer to impersonate. So I'll do the Willie Nelson part of <laughs> To All the Girls That I've Loved Before, and you do the Julio Iglesias part, and we'll, we'll make it match up. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I will say that song is not appropriate to sing in church. So we. <laughs> I would not think so. <laughs> yeah. But if, if, but but if yeah. Julio decided to study ecclesiology, how would you say that then in Spanish? Julio Ecclesiologist? Eccles, ecclesiologist? Not even going to try. Somebody's going to fix okay. this in the comments. Somebody's going to help us all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, while we're defining right. terms, I think that this is a great opportunity for us to dig into this question of, of well, some distinctions that we would have made um, and that were mm -hmm. made a big deal out of during the Reformation. So uh, if you were asked, Ken, as a Baptist pastor, I'll start with you. Uh, what is the church? And you were to try and mm -hmm. articulate this question that came out in the Reformation of this dichotomy of the visible or the invisible church. Like, where'd you come down on that question and what did you mean by any of it? Okay, I'm putting myself back many, many years when I was mm -hmm. uh, an evangelical and a Baptist pastor. And how would I have answered the question, what is the church? I would have said, pretty simply, I would have said the church is the full number of those who have come to personal faith in Christ, those who have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God and have become members of Christ's spiritual body. Okay, the church is those who belong to Jesus. Now, uh, as for the words visible and invisible, Matt, um, you know, I guess I'd have to say both and in a certain way. Of course, I believe the church was visible, but when I said that, when I used that word, I would have been speaking of it in the most basic sense that, you know, Christians are not invisible. And when Christians gather together um, at a church building to worship, to study, to do the things they do, you can see them. You know, So yeah, in that sense, the church is visible. But really, in the most profound sense or in the most important sense, I would have said that the church is invisible, meaning that those who truly belong to Jesus are known ultimately only to him. So in, in that yeah. sense, you and I can't look out and see the church. Only Jesus can see the church. 
Um, the churches that we see when we look are mixtures of true believers, the truly regenerate, and those who are not. Um, those who tru- truly know the Lord and are members of his body, and those who are not. And so, anyway, the church is comprised of those who know Christ. These are scattered all about the world, existing in all the various Christian churches and movements and denominations and sects, or even not in any one of them, maybe, just as individuals. So in mm-hmm. this important sense, the most important sense, the church, I would have said, is invisible mm-hmm. to us, to us. How about you, yeah, someone I, else? Yeah, I, I think I'll jump in there, Ken, and say, you know, if you can imagine a scale, right? Uh, what is it? Lady Justice holding holding her scales. So you have one of these weighted scales, you know, uh, the left side invisible, the right side visible. Mm-hmm. Which one was heavier in my ecclesiology? I would say I had some weight on, on both sides, visible and invisible. But if I, if you really just kind of step back and say, which, which side weighs more? The invisible side was heavier, uh, in my, ecclesiology mm-hmm. before I was Catholic. And I've thought a lot about this, and there's a, a lot of different reasons why, but I'll just pick one. And it has to do with the particular eschatology that I subscribed to and that many uh, Pentecostals subscribe to, and that's dispensationalism, some form of dispensationalism, and especially rapture theology. So if you go on YouTube now, you can find videos uh, dramatized videos of, you know, uh, mostly Baptist church services, just to poke on the Baptists, but a, let's say a Baptist church service, and everybody's singing their hymns and everybody's, you know, preaching. And then all of a sudden the rapture happens and the whole church, minus about 12 people, is left. And then all these people fall down <laughs> and they start wailing because they've been left behind. And in order to have yeah. that kind of perspective that that Jesus would come during a church service and there'd be 12 people left, you would have to have an invisible church ecclesiology primarily. You would have to be thinking, well, I was here and I thought we were all Christians, but gosh, I was wrong. We weren't all Christians. Mm-hmm. In fact, many of us weren't. And therefore, this the church must be invisible. So I would say that people who subscribe to that kind of eschatology would tend to weigh heavily on the invisible church mentality. And we see invisible you know, we to us. see people invisible to us, exactly. Yeah. Visible to God, but invisible to us. And and you know, we've talked about this before, that to a degree, you know, we're able to think like this as Catholics when we hear, for instance, the parable of uh, you know the wheat and the tares, and at the end of the age, the mm-hmm. angels come and gather everything and separate them, and they burn the weeds and they collect the harvest. And so we are able to to think of the, the church in terms of you know only the Lord really knows. But um, <laughs> we primarily had, at least I primarily had, an invisible church ecclesiology. Of course, I thought I was part of that in, invisible church. <laughs> um, but my concept of the church is very, apart from that, Ken, is very similar to yours. It's just everybody who believes in Jesus in the simplest terms you could get. Uh, everyone who believes in Jesus, no matter what their background is or what affiliation they have, they're all the church and, and Jesus knows them. And the last thing I'll say uh, which I've shared with you guys before is, you know, one of the songs that I learned early on was sung by the Imperials. And uh, there's a line in this song that says, you know, um, uh, I don't care what label you may wear. If you believe in Jesus, you belong with me. There's a bond we share. And so that's kind of the ecclesiology that I subscribe to. It doesn't really matter what church you go to as long as you believe in Jesus. Then you can pick your brand from there. But that was my perspective. And we're going to get into more of that in depth in here in just a moment Um, and and what you're supposed to make of if you're in an invisible church, but there's a whole bunch of people who might belong to invisible churches who are going to different pastors than you guys, (laughs) right, (laughs) to to do their weekly, you know, check-in. So uh, my, my particular spin on this again my um 
my background was more in the in the Wesley and Arminian through the Nazarene, Methodist, Free Methodist, uh, even a little bit uh, time hanging out with some house church restorationists. Uh, this is this is you know kind of boilerplate Protestantism in general. This idea of an invisible church. But what I can say about my particular um, frustration, and I, I kind of sum it up with with the C.S. Lewis atheism dilemma. Um, I would firmly say that there was no visible church, that the church was an invisible reality. But at the same time, I hungered for a visible church. So I would hear sermons, and I would you know parrot this back out to other people. The church is not a building. The church is not an organization. The church is those who belong to Christ. Um, but Lewis said famously uh, about his whirl of contradictions he lived in as an atheist, and he said, um, I maintained that God did not exist. I was also very angry with God for not existing. So part of my um, journey on this was kind of coming to this question of how do Christians operate in the world and what are we supposed to be doing? And why are we letting the government take care of the poor when that's our, that's what we should be doing? We need to take this over. Why are we letting the government take over housing for those people who are struggling? That's the church's job and we're falling down on it. The problem is, is that no church I ever attended could possibly ever sustain the infrastructure among its tiny membership to heal even a fraction. Like, yeah, I mean, we could heal pieces and parts of things. We could run a soup kitchen and we could like do a diaper drive. But I wanted a visible church, right? I wanted this thing that we were really all a part of that could be a beacon of light in the world. But there was just no no mechanism for making it happen. No mechanism for aligning all the people who are in all who are of the invisible church but going to different congregations every week to all be on the same page to mm-hmm. fix the problems in our community the way that I saw it being done in the book of Acts, to be quite frank. I mean, this is clear. This is what the church did mm-hmm. from, like, day one. So um, that, to me, was kind of like a, a whirl of contradictions and frustrations. Mm-hmm. The only thing I'll add to that is that, you know, I Bible quizzed in the Church of the Nazarene, and we Bible quizzed on Ephesians, and I would have wholeheartedly affirmed what i mean this is not a verse i never saw i did very much see paul in ephesians chapter 2 verses uh you know 19 and forward paul says you're no longer foreigners and aliens but citizens with god's people members of god's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with christ jesus himself as the chief cornerstone in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the lord i would have affirmed that i would also have affirmed that this is an entirely a purely spiritual reality. <laughs> so um, not mm-hmm. something that can really be seen, I guess, attested to in the world and seen. So mm-hmm. um, that's kind of where I was on this. Yeah. Um, yeah. You ready to dive, dive deep into something that Kenny just touched on that I think really helps illuminate this more? Um, sure. I mean, let's, let's, let's talk about the denominational uh, aspect of this. Um, so what connection, if any, did you think you had as a Baptist, Kenny, or Ken, and as a mm-hmm. Foursquare pastor, Kenny, with the other denominations and churches that are in your own town, right? Or the people who are in your denomination, but in another part of the world. <laughs> so how did you how did you feel that was supposed to all fit together? Um, we'll start with you, Kenny. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> How do I describe this? Um, I, you know, to be a little bit re- reflective and retrospective, I'll use, I'll use a phrase here. Kenny Burchard back then was, uh, thought about denominationalism as kind of a pick your flavor enterprise. Okay. So in that mm-hmm. sense, I would say my ecclesiology was this. The church is invisible, uh, primarily, maybe a little bit visible to people. My job then is to go and look for the Christians that I feel an affinity for theologically, practically, you mm-hmm. know, liturgically, whatever you want to, however you want to say it, missionally. And once I find my flavor, my brand, my tribe, some people use that, well, then I just affiliate myself to those people. I'm not necessarily, especially with the groups that I was with, saying, well, I've found the one true and only version of Christianity that ever existed, and I've attached myself to that, and everything else is, you know, fake by comparison. 
But I, I would say I found the denomination I liked best that I thought <laughs> was the truest yeah. and, and clearest expression. And I affiliated with that based on preference. I didn't have an ecclesiology that would have excluded other denominations from, from Christianity. I just excluded myself from them because I felt that my brand or my tribe was the best one. Now, there are groups that I fellowshiped with or, you know, got to know who had a much more rigid view of denominationalism than I did. In other words, some denominations are more or less true or false Christians than others, but um, that wasn't the group I was running with. So your preferences, Kenny, didn't have to do with doctrinal preferences? It was mainly other kinds of preferences? I, I mean, I think they did have to do with doctrinal preferences, but again, I wasn't, I wasn't camped out on, on dogma, perhaps, as, as much as other traditions mm -hmm. would be. So I really felt that there were a lot of things that you just couldn't know whether or not this was true. For instance, your eschatology, mm -hmm. the end times, or your view of uh, men versus women in ministry, or the present operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, things like that. I just felt like, well, it's all up for grabs mm -hmm. theologically, and I just like the theology, the doctrines of this denomination best. No mm -hmm. one can really know uh, which one is true and which one is false, so I just picked my brand. You know, uh, well, well, I do. Uh, we all believe in the Trinity, and we all believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. But then from there, it's just all bets are off, and find your favorite tribe. Um, so th theology was there, but it wasn't everything, if you will. My response to this question about denominations is is similar to yours, Kenny. I guess, yeah. I mean, I mean, the bottom line is it, it, it's sort of the same. Matt asked the question, "How did I feel about?" other denominations, the fact that there were other denominations and other Christians and all that. And I, I, I guess it's just, it was very natural for me as a Baptist to feel a closer connection to other Baptist churches in my area, and especially in my denomination, because there might have been Baptist churches from six different Baptist denominations in my area, and I wouldn't have known them and wouldn't have had anything to do with them because I was busy with the Baptist churches of my particular denomination. So yeah, it would be natural to feel closer to them than I did, for instance, to Presbyterian churches, Presbyterians, or Lutherans, or Methodists, or Anglican, or Orthodox, or for sure, a Catholic. Um, but again, back to the basic ecclesiology, which I agree with you on the scale issue, weighted on the side of invisible. To me, anyone who, quote, you know, who knew Christ, Anyone who had come to faith in the Lord Jesus and loved the Lord and wanted to grow as a Christian was my brother and was my sister in the Lord. And Tina and I had good friends who were Presbyterians. We had uh, good friends that are Seventh-day Adventists. So, so I felt closer to people who were like me. And I would have to say that mine was my, my decision to be a Baptist was, was a doctrinal decision. You know, um, it wasn't, it wasn't style of music or, or style of dress or anything like that. Um, but I want to say one more thing about that, because the fact that people went to other churches, you know, I was aware of that. I mean, you know, as I've told before, I came to faith in Christ in a completely non-denominational environment, a home, a home Bible study, knowing very little. Well, I, I became aware over time that there were plenty of churches and there were plenty of different uh, basic theological systems, you know, within the Christian world. Um, I saw this as something that was natural and something that was inevitable. And I really wasn't bothered a lot by it. And, and, and that's because of Sola Scriptura. You know, given that in my world and, and in the world of every Christian I knew, Scripture was the only real authority in our lives, then I knew that the best we can do is be students of Scripture, work hard, study hard, pray, and do our best to decide what we think the best system of Christian theology is. And so, you know, I knew that people wouldn't agree, and I knew that people hadn't agreed. I knew that there were people at least as smart as I was in all these various denominations, and undoubtedly people smarter than I am, and holier than I am, people who prayed more, people who studied more. And so, I just viewed it as um, 
it wasn't something good. It was it, it was a sad situation that there were mm. all these denominations, mm. but all that really mattered was do people love love the Lord? And I just sort of stuck with that and figured there was really no 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 real answer ultimately to the division issue. I knew it wasn't the best, but the bottom line is I was busy enough trying to live my own life before before the Lord and trying to deal with my own congregation and all the interactions and problems related to my congregation and my denomination. I was busy enough to not worry too much about what the Pre Presbyterians were up to or the mm -hmm. Lutherans or the Nazarenes or anybody else. That's where I was at. Well, you missed out because we were up to some interesting stuff. But at least us Nazarenes what are you were. About? Exactly. Oh, yeah? Well, you would, I, would, I, I can't tell it. you until you sign a NDA on it. Uh, <laughs> I believe it. But from my own perspective, I mean, the denominational question, I started off thinking it was just a matter of taste. Like my mom's side of the family was country Methodist, you know, him singing, piano playing, yeah. where it was a little bit more formalized on my dad's side with the Presbyterian roots. And then we were kind of more of like a Maranatha praise chorus kind of vibe mixed with some hymn singing on the Sunday nights in my Nazarene world. Like, I thought it was a matter of taste. You went where you liked the preacher, you liked the music. Uh, once I started working at Christian bookstores and going to a... Uh, a Christian liberal arts college, it became very clear to me that these were not merely matters of taste that were dividing people. Uh, but, you know, Kenny, you dropped uh, the Imperials on us a moment ago uh, with this whole denomination question. I'll drop two more on you. Uh, one will be Mylon Lefevre and uh, Mylon and Broken Heart and their song Denomination Demolition, uh, right? Which is uh, the, uh, the, the chorus goes, Denomination Demolition, life shouldn't be a competition we can fulfill the great commission denomination demolition there was this sense in which you know maybe this is just a whole bunch of people trying to corner the market on something and there's a lot of cynical uh attitudes toward that in in my world as i got older uh or uh when uh, i mean the other aspect of this is kind of captured in the 77 song uh denomination blues that maybe these denominations are kind of run by seminaries where people go and they get educated beyond their intelligence as my grandfather would say mm -hmm. and uh, you know, they were going and you know messing around this highfalutin stuff that didn't actually matter to the people on the street. So, um, and denomination blues, Mike Rowe sings. You know, you can go to college, you can go to school, but without Jesus, you're just an educated fool, <laughs> right? Um, there's actually a sentiment of that that's similar, True. similarly expressed in uh, Saint Bonaventure. By the way, uh, Saint Bonaventure says that any old woman can love God better than a doctor of theology can, <laughs> right? Uh, of course, Bonaventure is a doctor of the church. But there's that. there was kind of that sentiment about the denominational splits, uh, you know, being sort of meaningless and stupid. Uh, yeah. But I was really a mess of contradictions on this question because, you know, one day I would think to myself, none of these divisions and distinctions matter. We're all Christians. We're all in this together. And the next day I would think to myself, not a single human being on this planet has it right. <laughs> you know right that, i mean so i was a mess of contradictions there was and i felt like there was something out there but it was ungraspable like you couldn't i felt like christianity had stayed faithful somehow from christ to the present day but you couldn't sort of trace how it had done so the way that paul could say clearly in the new testament that he was from the tribe of benjamin that he knew how to trace his tribe back like i didn't know how to do that um and we'll get into that here in just a minute, but actually, let's get into it right now. Like, would it have mattered for you to be able to trace your tribe all the way back? Would you? Would it have mattered to you, um, Kenny, to say the Foursquare Church was founded by Jesus Christ? Like, would you have ever <laughs> said that? Or, like, would you have cared about that reality? You know, that I think that is such a great question for this series and for this show and for what we do at the coming home network, like asking a question like that is really important. Uh, so you ask it to me, do you think Kenny that Jesus was the founder of the four square church, you know, and, that, and, and it's by doing, by doing such a thing, you could trace your lineage all the way, all the way back to Jesus. I think the answer is mixed, but in order to answer the question with a, solid no <laughs> i don't think that my denomination was founded by jesus i'll take you back to my ordination i was i was ordained in the foursquare church um i you know pastored in a foursquare church for for 12 of the 20 years that i was in pastoral ministry 
And at my ordination, I was brought up front with all the other pastors that were being ordained. My district supervisor was there in our church government. He would be kind of like a bishop, uh, an, an Episcopal overseer. And then all the pastors from my district, from churches surrounding uh, the area where I was pastoring, they came up to the front. They were all there. Mm. And they all gathered around me, and they all laid their hands on me. And one of the elders from our church was also there. So I had this group of five or six men standing around me while my divisional superintendent and district supervisor were praying over us. And I had my head bowed and all these hands on me. The whole time, guys, that this prayer over me for ordination was happening, I kid you not, I was thinking, what right? (laughs) What right do these men have to lay hands on me? I was thinking that at Mm. my ordination. What (laughs) right do these men have to lay their hands on me and to tell me that I am an ordained minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then I started doing it with them. What right do they have to be called? <laughs> you know, And it was, it was kind of a crisis moment at my ordination where I started kind of doing this infinite regress all the way back. And in my denomination, we would trace ourselves back to one person, and that wouldn't be Jesus. That would be a evangelist in the early 1900s who felt mm-hmm. that she was called by God to start this evangelistic enterprise and a church a denomination grows up out of her ministry and the Lord was at work in 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 all of that work for sure but was it Jesus who started it I think that's a different question and I would say no I would say people who loved Jesus and wanted to follow mm. Jesus started it, but that's different from, from Jesus starting it. And uh, what, what we find in the Gospel of Matthew, for instance, is Jesus saying, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not yeah. prevail against it. So I don't think that yeah. Jesus founded my church. I think people who love Jesus did. I think that's different. Think that's different. Well, you know what? You know what? Even though you just quoted Matthew 16, even though Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, I didn't really think that Jesus had founded a church. I I don't think I really thought that right. way. You know, I I thought more like this: Jesus came, wow. he taught, he suffered, he died, he rose from the dead, and he sent and the apostles went out preaching this message. People listening to their message came to faith in Jesus and began to form little congregations, which we think of as the church or churches. And, uh, you know, and they ordained pastors and teachers to lead them. So I didn't really think of Jesus as founding a church at all. I, I, I don't think I, I thought of him more as, as, um, well, the, as, being the essence of the gospel and the gospel goes out and churches kind of form in a nat- natural way through the preaching. So, so I didn't yeah. think that, you know, it, it, but, but of course, on the other hand, I was a Baptist. Okay. And so if I didn't think that the Baptist church or the Baptist theology reflected the doctrine and practice of the earliest congregations, then I wouldn't have been a Baptist. And I, right. I, I would think you would, you would have to say the same thing, even though it was started yeah. by this female evangelist if you didn't believe that that what you were doing there represented most closely the doctrine and practice of the earliest Christians, you wouldn't have been in that church, right? Yes, uh, yeah, I think I think you're right there. But there's another implicit theological idea here, ecclesiological idea here, Ken, in what you just said. Uh, you could frame it as a question or as a statement. Can you? Here's the question: Can you, just based on the teaching of Jesus? Go out and ordain yourself and then ordain other people to be <laughs> ministers of the gospel. Like, are you allowed to do that? Well, you yeah. and I have talked a lot about the movie The Apostle, yeah. right? Where, where, yeah. um, where the main character basically baptizes himself as an apostle. He, he ordains himself and then he, yeah. of course, now he has authority. Like, can you do that? Can you really do that? Well, the implicit theology that I held to, 
by by virtue of being part of a denomination that started that way is yeah, yeah. you can ordain yourself yeah. <laughs> and then you can take it upon yourself to ordain other people and it just like it takes off it's like a, it's like a grass fire it just like well someone back here lit the match and now it's just you know it's it's traveled and i think that in many especially let's call them low church evangelical protestant denominations and non-denominational groups mm -hmm. the idea of self-ordination it might be repugnant to say such a thing but at least the idea and the practice is something that's just done all the time People just start, they just go hang a shingle and start a church and ordain themselves and ordain other people. And there's a theology in there that says, well, you can just do that if you want to. And of course, I, I have a conviction that's very different from that now that I'm a Catholic, but I definitely believed that way before. Okay. I want to say one more thing about this, 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 this bit before I, I want to see what Matt has to say too, but okay. The very first group that I was that I belonged to <clears throat> because they are the group that, that I, that first brought me to Christ. Okay. They had a theological position, which I won't go into explaining, but kind of a radical dispensational position, which amounted to the belief. Well, it didn't amount to it. It, it explicitly was it contained the belief that there were only two churches in the United States who had it right. There were only two. And, and at the time, I remember feeling so privileged. I felt, I, I, I felt like, Lord, how amazing that I come to faith in you. And I happen to be in this denomination that only has two churches in the, in the United States that are right. It's just amazing that you led me to the truth like, like that. Okay. So yes, what you're saying though is implicit in the idea of the invisible church. Because again, if the gospel goes out, the apostles preaching, people come to faith in Jesus, they form little congregations meeting in homes or parks mm -hmm. or wherever they can, and then they begin to select people to be their pastors and teachers, and they ordain them, then ordination is, is something that comes up from the bottom. It's not something that comes down. Right. Although I know we're going to get into this later, so I don't want to go yes. off on it. But, you know, when Paul says to Timothy, don't lay hands on people too, you know, in the New Testament, I realize now that ordination is something that comes down from the apostles to their successors. Right. But in right. my world, ordination was something that came up from the congregation. So there would be nothing strange about a congregation just meeting in a home somewhere if they decided that I was gifted to be their pastor. I guess there would be nothing strange about them laying hands on me and praying and ordaining me into the ministry. So anyway... Right. Uh, I, I think I've said enough on that whole thing. I mean, I definitely thought that the Baptist theology was the original Christian theology and that just just very soon it began to morph itself and degrade itself into something much more elaborate, much more ritualistic, something more, much more hierarchical, which became Orthodox Catholic um, Christianity. And I did believe that it took, uh, you know, 15 centuries until the time of the Reformation to, to get back to um, to the true stuff. I did believe that. Anyway, well, Matt, very... do you have something to throw into the can here? Well, as you're saying that, it just strikes me that, you know, there's some things that were taken very, and we'll get into this later on, as very physical um sacramental realities in the church that we saw as kind of metaphors. I mean, I knew all kinds of people that were talked about, I mean, they would say this about, you know, song leaders, right, and preachers, mm -hmm. that they were anointed. They'd say that someone was anointed, even if that person had never been physically oiled up ever, right? <laughs> you know, they just say, right. what they meant by that is that person has a gift, all right? Um, they'd say, so they'd use anointing in that way. Um, but on this question of whether it mattered, whether Jesus founded our church or not, just to give you a picture of, of my denominational progression, as it were, which was never built on, like, reading the articles of religion and saying, well, this is what we agree with. And was, I mean, it mattered, right? It, the basic stuff mattered, but we were not selecting that way. But what I found that happened in my own life is I started out as a little kid, a very small kid, in the United Methodist Church. We'll say 12 million-ish in that denomination. Ended up going to the Church of the Nazarene through mm -hmm. my middle school years. You're looking at closer to like 3 million worldwide. From there, moved on to Free Methodist. You're looking at about 1.5 million from there. 
you know, ended up in a house church when there's maybe a couple dozen of us, right? And the way I was going, it was going to be just me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and in all those questions, I would say... Well, at least there did, would have been one Christian left. At least we'd have had yeah, somebody showing up every week. This church <laughs> yeah. followed me around wherever I went, Sorry. man. Um, but, but what would have mattered to me is not the question of, did Jesus found my church? But rather... And this is going to sound like a meaningless distinction, but it's not. Was Jesus the foundation of my church? So that's where I qu- probably would have made the distinction. And 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 to illustrate it, let's yeah. say, okay, well, let's say, <laughs> Hensley, you decide that tomorrow you're going to start um, Hensley and Hensley Attorneys at Law. Um, I would have seen this question, you know, as I was reading earlier from Ephesians 2, that the church is built upon uh, the foundation of the apostles and prophets you know the way that i would have seen it would have been the way that i would see you and your law firm hensley and hensley attorney at law to be built on a foundation of compassion and integrity and transparency and personal connection right well, those are your don't forget money principles don't and money don't forget money and money okay <laughs> but we only pay you if you only have to pay us if it get a settlement in your favor but okay. the idea of the the Christ is the is the foundation, but not necessarily the yeah. founder. Uh, I I I don't know how to articulate that fully, but that's that's a distinction yeah. that I would have made. Um, that it matters that we were trying to recapture something mm-hmm. that other people had lost. They had lost their sense of Christ as their foundation, and so when I saw like who who were who was sparking these movements. It was them trying to reclaim that foundation um, rather than to say this was founded in the way that the Catholic Church would say it was founded by Christ. Right, right, right. Ooh, what about the Catholic Church? Yeah. You ready to talk about the Catholic Church? Sure. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. All right. We'll talk about the Catholic Church. I'll go first. So (laughs) Catholic Church, not on my radar. um, As you hear people so often say on the journey home, not on my radar at all. I'll use the baseball analogy. Uh, because it seems to be just so handy in so many ways. Uh, That's weird. I know it's it's uncharacteristic of me, but I'm going to go out on a limb here. Um, I viewed the Catholic Church as this thing that didn't really like exist anymore. It certainly didn't exist in my world. Bear in mind, I grew up in small town America. Um, my roots were Southern. Uh, we were built on the Bible. When I saw mm-hmm. Catholics on television or envisioned who they were. I thought big city folk, northerners in places like Chicago and New York City and Boston in big, formal, ritualistic, dead ritualistic churches. Now, just so you know, Chicago, Boston, New York City, that's Cubs and Red Sox and Yankees. Those are not my people. I'm telling you, those are not my people. (laughs) Those are the teams I root against. Uh, Mm -hmm. So um, when I thought of Catholicism, it was hard for me to even think of it as like a reality, just like I could hardly in Kentucky think that Mm -hmm. I would randomly run into a Yankees fan, right? (laughs) I just wouldn't do it. It just wasn't a reality. So uh, it's kind of hard for me to even figure out how to put it in that conversation. And it wasn't until very late in the game that I did put it in the conversation. Um, And it was quite by accident. And we can go into that in future segments. But I'm curious about you, Ken. Uh, where did the Catholic Church fit in this picture for you? Yeah, and would I have included Catholics uh, in my in the category Christian? Would I have included it, or included the Catholic Church in the category of denomination, Christian denominations? Okay, my my thinking about Catholicism will obviously change, but it evolved during my years as an evangelical. I would say mm-hmm. once I discarded this mm-hmm. radical dispensationalism where I where there were only two churches that really fit me, once I discarded that, I began to fall in love with the reformers, the classical reformers, Luther, Calvin, Melanchthon, the others, and the Puritans especially. So for about eight years, I would say I was just getting deeper and deeper and deeper into the Puritan, or that is the Protestant reformed world. My heroes had names like Robert Murray McShane, George Whitfield, John Bunyan, John Owen, Jonathan Edwards, and and many others. So these were my heroes, I would say, in the first decade of my Christian life, really. And for them, the Catholic Church 
was the whore of Babylon. It was, uh, you know, the, the Pope was the Antichrist. They had a very, very negative view of Catholicism. And so I just kind of accepted that view. That became my view. It was uh, by osmosis. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really studied Catholicism, but that was my view. And so for me, that, that, that's where I began. But later on, I had experiences. You know, for instance, I began to visit this Benedictine monastery out here in Southern California for retreats. And I began to meet the monks that were there and talk to the priests. And I began to realize these guys know the Lord. These guys are Christians. And then as a pastor getting involved in pro-life movement, I met a lot of Catholics in pro-life events. And the same thing, beginning to realize these guys, these people are Christians. And so mm -hmm. I, I think that by the time that I began to actually study the Catholic faith, which was the beginning of my of the road into the Catholic Church. By the time I got to that point where I was willing to look at Catholicism as something possibly not totally insane, totally heretical, and totally wrong, I was open enough to the idea that Catholicism was Christianity and that Catholics were Christians, as wrong as they might have been theologically, as many you know uh, barnacles as they might have on their on their ship, all these false doctrines regarding Mary and purgatory and the papacy and things like that. Um, I I looked at them as probably Christians, and so beginning to read about Catholicism, it wasn't it wasn't like just drinking bottle after bottle of cod liver oil or something like that. I was I was ready to to accept that Catholicism mm -hmm. was a form of Christianity, however wrong. What about you, yeah. Kenny? You know, I, I think I went through an evolution as well. And you guys have heard me talk about this in different ways um, through a couple of our series. I think very early on, I would have parroted, um, you know, the words of some of the people who were my mentors and said that there was probably a time where Catholicism and the Catholic Church really was true Christianity, but that over time it became a wayward and apostate denomination or version of Christianity that was no longer Christianity. So this is an, a, mm -hmm. an apostate denomination, basically, is how I would have kind of thought about it. And But then like you, Ken, I met Catholics who were very sincerely and passionately involved in their faith, in the pro-life movement, just like just mm -hmm. like you. And I thought, well, these people are really Christians. And when they pray, they really pray, you know, and, the, and they're really s serious about what they're doing. So I was willing to kind of give them a pass. So I think I kind of had a yes and no answer to this question. Let's say, uh, no, the Catholic Church is not a Christian yeah. denomination. No. No, it's a wayward and apostate <laughs> denomination. It has fallen away from Jesus. That's the no part of my answer. Yes, there are Christians inside of it, but they, mm -hmm. and then I call this the Rabbi, Z the Rabbi Zacharias answer. Yes, there are Christians inside of the Catholic Church, but they have to be bad Catholics in order to be good Christians. In other words, they have to be sitting there in the pew or listening to their pastors or whatever and saying, I totally disagree with this. I don't believe this at all. <laughs> Instead, I believe this thing that the, you know, the evangelicals and the Protestants believe, and I don't believe Catholicism, but I'm here inside my Catholic church, you know, gritting my teeth and being a true Christian despite it all. So I could find true, I was willing to agree that there might be a true Christian inside of a Catholic church, but Catholicism isn't true. Now, the final thing I'll say on this one is many of my friends, my current friends, who were friends with me before I was a Catholic, will talk to me and treat me in exactly the way that I just described. They'll say, some of them still call me Pastor Kenny, some of them call me Kenny. They'll say, Kenny, you're a real Christian, even though you're a Catholic. <laughs> you know, yeah, we get it that you're a Catholic now, but you know, you're, you're a real follower of Jesus as, you know, so they'll want to contrast me with Catholicism and the Catholic Church. Like these are just two very different things. And maybe I'm being a, I'm being a good Christian and a bad Catholic while I'm inside the, the Catholic Church. So that was sort of the mind, mm -hmm. 
game that I that I played with myself. If I drove by a Catholic church, I never thought to myself, "Oh, there's a there's a room full of Christians in there." I maybe thought, kind of like the the uh, marble in the paint can, there was one rattling around in there somewhere, <laughs> uh, but but who knows? All right, so. Uh, very briefly, if we can wrap this up by talking about how this ecclesiology in your mm. world began to unravel. Um, mm. So part of my world began to unravel because mm. I realized that I was keeping all these journals of all these great quotes from various people thinking, how can I like reassemble like the best parts of Christianity, just like recapture all the good stuff? And I realized, uh, you know, all too late, all the best stuff I was finding was from like these dead Catholics from decades mm. and centuries past. I'm thinking, well... I'll just take this quote for they, this person may have been wrong about other stuff, other stuff, but they were right about this thing and they were right about that thing. And they're right about this thing over there and realizing, <clears throat> wait a second, what kind of an arrogant jerk am I going around saying, well, so-and-so was right about this, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's a part of it. And also realizing that I'm ignoring the entire world that this person was informed by the entire worldview that underpinned this great thought that was coming from them. But also, and I've referenced this article before, Rod Bennett's got this great imagined conversation between two, I think it's Baptist seminarians. There's an article on our site, and I'll maybe link to it in the show notes, where one Baptist seminarian asks the other guy, hey, so you think this is a good school? And the guy's like, yeah. He's like, well, why do you think it's a good school? He's like, because the professors here teach the truth. It's like, how do you know they teach the truth? He's like, well, they teach what the word plainly says. Uh, he's like, so you're the one who's judging whether or not these guys are saying the right thing. Why aren't you teaching them? <laughs> right? Yeah, and so, yeah. I mean, right. that's a big piece of, right. of how it began to sort of unravel. It's kind of going back to what Kenny was saying about the, like, who told these guys they had the power to ordain me? Who told the people that right. ordained them, if they were ordained at all, that those guys had power? Like, and that, and the, the this, this growing frustration that you could not have Christian unity without a common authority. Ooh. And you could all say the common authority was Jesus, but we all meant yeah. something very different about what that looked like. Yeah. Um, and so there was you know, no I'm possible a... way to be unified. Mm. Mm. You, you know, let me jump off yours and then let Kenny have the final word on this subject. Um, we are going to be talking a lot in this whole series about our path toward the Catholic Church on a number of different issues related to ecclesiology. So I just want to give one, I guess, it's sort of a watershed moment for me. And it's, and, and it's very much along the same lines as what you just said, Matt, and that is dealing with the issue of authority. I would say that there was a watershed moment for me, and I'm just picking out one, when, I, when the realization began to sink into my bones that sola scriptura, the idea that the Bible would function as our sole authority, really, for faith and practice our sole real authority for faith and practice. When the realization began to dawn on me that this doesn't work, it can't work, and that it couldn't be the way Jesus established his church, that it didn't make sense. And one of the passages that was so important to me, which I'll treat, and I'm going to try and I'm going to read it, but I'm going to treat it very succinctly, is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, which I want you to hear, first of all. He's talking about Jesus ascending to heaven and giving gifts to his church, and St. Paul writes this. His gifts were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. There's that word, Matt, that you just used, unity. <clears throat> <clears throat> of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we would no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the cunning of men, by their craftiness in deceitful wiles. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in him in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint with which it is supplied, when each part is working properly, makes bodily growth and upbuilds itself in love. Okay, the essence of what Paul is saying here is that Christ gave gifts of pastors and teachers to his church to build the church up in unity 
so that the children of God would not be blown about by every wind and wave of, of doctrine. And I, I would say a watershed moment for me, you two, was when it struck me that the only way what Paul is describing here could work is if all pastors and teachers were bound to a common theology. Because once the church grows and spreads and fills the entire world, if the pastors and teachers in Vietnam or in Chicago or in Mexico City or in Nome, Alaska or in Chad, Africa, if the pastors and teachers are all bound to one common theology, they're teaching one doctrine of God, one doctrine of Christ, the Trinity, the church, ecclesiology, one doctrine of salvation, one doctrine of the sacraments. If they're teaching, if they're bound to one doctrine, then when they teach, they will be building up the church in unity. Right. They will be keeping the people of God from being blown about by every wind and wave of doctrine. On the other hand, and this is the other side of the, the coin, if the only real authority that pastors and teachers have on earth is their New Testament, their Bible, their New Testament, then when they go out and fill the world and they're spread all over and they knuckle down and they put their noses to the grindstone and they study the Bible and they pray, they're going to come up with different doctrines, which they have, which they have. <laughs> and b because they are going to come up with different doctrines, then the pastor in Moscow and the pastor in Nome, Alaska and the pastor in Mexico City, when they teach, they are going to be blowing the children of God about by every wind and wave of doctrine. And so right. the thing to, to, to sum that up, the thing that struck me, you two, was that based on Sola Scriptura, the vision that Paul has in Ephesians chapter 4 would be impossible. And it has proven to be impossible because since the time of the Reformation, only 500 years ago, we have pastors and teachers, smart guys, good guys, sincere guys, sincere men and women who pray and who study scattered all over the world, teaching different doctrines. Yes. And therefore blowing the children of God about so that, so that I know so many children of God that have been to one denomination and then they got blown about to another one. And then someone convinced them and they went to another one and another one. And it just struck me. This cannot be the way that our Lord would have founded his church. That was a watershed mm -hmm. moment for me. How about you, Kenny? So you're saying that, I was going to say, so you're saying that yeah. the body of Christ is an actual body and not an armored truck full of organs and soft-sided coolers. Because that's essentially the yeah. vision that we had <laughs> when it comes right. down to it. I'll have to think about that for a while, Matt, that image. <laughs> Don't think about it too well, hard. It's kind of gross. <laughs> I had a watershed moment too, guys. You know, I, I've talked about, you know, one already in this, in this um, episode, my ordination was a moment of deep questioning right mm -hmm. in the middle of being ordained, you know, but listen, another watershed moment for me. And I would say like one of the biggest ones was when I was in seminary. When I was in seminary, I was in a New Testament program. I was studying the books of the New Testament, and I was in my course on the book of Acts. And at the same time, I was also part of a theological society uh, with Charismatics and Pentecostals in a, in a particular um, a group of, uh, of Christians that would, that would collaborate together you know, theologically. And while I was in seminary and while I was writing papers, you know, theological papers, I decided to combine uh, two projects in my course on the book of Acts and do a paper, not only for an assignment, but for scholarly submission on the Jerusalem Council and what happened mm. in the book of Acts in the Jerusalem Council, where there is this theological mm. dispute among the apostles and the Judaizers and this wind of right. different doctrines is blowing God's people all over. And so I wrote this paper and came up with all of these attributes of the, the church, that they had apostolic authority, that they could convene 
a council that they could decide universally for all Christians what was and was not true, that they could bind all Christians to their conclusions, that they could disseminate their message to the whole world and say, this is Christianity and this is not. You know, I, I came up with this whole sort of litany of, of um, conclusions. And at the end of the, a paper like this, especially if you present it in, you know, like in a, in a, um, a scholarly context where you stand up and read your paper, you'll often uh, put out a question for further discussion. And I did that. And my question for further discussion was this. Does the church in this text in Acts still exist in the world today? And if so, where can we find it? Does the church in the book of Acts 15 that convened this council and had all this authority... Does that church still exist in the world today? And if so, where can we find it? So at the the presentation of my paper, the person who was facilitating uh, the dialogue around my paper, wow. she said publicly, no, such a church does not exist today. Uh, there's no way any church can do what was done in the text of Scripture. So now I have a church in Scripture divorced from my present reality. I can find a church right. in the Bible that I can't find in the world. That, so she says that, that that's the state of things. Then I went to my seminary professor, who I love to this day, and asked him the same question. Does the church in the book of Acts, still in this, especially in this text, still exist today? And if so, where can we find it? And he said the same thing. No, Kenny. Mm -hmm. This process that you're witnessing in the book of Acts now is something that denominations and congregations and groups can use, but in no way does any church now have the same kind of binding authority upon all Christians that this church in the book of Acts has. And I, I want to tell you guys that that was a moment of darkness for me and shock and depression and discouragement because there I was reading about a church that my professors and my mentors told me for all practical purposes no longer existed in the world. And I remember thinking, well, then what is to keep cults and false teachers, et cetera, et cetera, from just starting their own thing? And you sort of step back and say, well, that's exactly what's happened. If you have an ecclesiology, yeah. and I'll, maybe I'll end with this, going back to the very beginning of this episode, if you have an ecclesiology in which your church is primarily invisible and the only authority is the Bible, then you never know who the real Christians really are, and you're really just left with trying to find a group of people that teach the Bible the way you think it ought to be taught. And it's like, well, here's your Bible. Good luck, you know. And that's how I felt at, at that time. Mm. And so, even though I didn't become Catholic right away after that watershed moment, I want to say that a hunger, a passionate hunger to find the church that Jesus founded kind of took over my life. And I would end with this. Right. Jesus founded a church, a visible church. And I came to discover that. And I guess we'll probably talk about that in the next several episodes. Yeah, probably. I mean, I <laughs> we we might I aim we could. To. It could happen. It could happen. <laughs> we could. Well, any parting shots before we put a bow on this? Because I feel like this is uh, we've laid a lot of juicy things on the table, and well, uh, here, we haven't even gotten here, to. Uh, here's the meat my of bow. Things. Here's my bow on what Kenny just said. The, the 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 thought came to me at one point that the difference between Protestantism and Catholicism is that Catholicism believes that the church we see operating in Acts chapter 15 still exists yes. and Protestantism doesn't. Protestantism instead says basically what we have after the death of the apostles is, is an inspired book and then you know, well, you use the phrase, Kenny, good luck, you know, and I say, you know, Jesus right. just sort of tossed an inspired book out into the crowd and said, do your best. Yeah, right. but we don't get the list of what belongs in the New Testament uh, of don't. that inspired book until half a century after the Nicene Creed, which states, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
Don't, so, don't get into that, Matt. Yeah, I will going to spoil a whole bunch of episodes if I go any save further it, down that road. <laughs> but hopefully this gives you a taste of what's coming down the pipeline. Please do check out previous episodes of On the Journey with Matt and Ken and Kenny at chnetwork.org. If you want to discuss these questions with others who are on the journey or maybe a step ahead of you on the journey, uh, please check out our online community, which is community.chnetwork.org. Dot org. And all this is made possible by generous donors. If you want to join their ranks, especially becoming a monthly donor, that's the biggest help to us. Uh, it helps us be able to, to plan and, and predict things. Go to chnetwork.org yes. slash compass, and uh, we would love to have you participate in the mission in that way. Gentlemen, thank you again. We'll talk to you next time around. Good to be back with you. We'll see you soon. See you guys. <laughs>